Great. All right. So, uh, this is my good friend Galen Hall. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of how we know. How, I don't remember what how old I was when we met, but uh, well, he was a monstrous twelve-year-old. So Believe it. <laughs> he, he was, if you can imagine, he was bouncing off every wall that, that, that existed. Yeah. That's his That's his No, no. That's, that's his, it's it's his a possible. lot. He's tempered. This is this, this is, is a temper. Temper. This is temper. Oh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Uh, but Galen has been a good friend and mentor to my wife and I for many, many years. In fact, he officiated our wedding. Uh, and uh, so I would appreciate, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, it, it, it's exciting for me that he's here, that he got to come out today. He actually, he's been in the car for like six hours. Today, I don't know, poor guy, his wife's car blew up and he went and fixed it. And then, uh, and then he even drove the extra two whatever hours out back out to here so he could speak to you guys. So please make sure, yeah. Please, uh, please give him your full attention. Uh, what he has to say is something that will be good for you guys to hear. So pay attention. Well, I will say before we get started that even though Trevor was a very energetic, probably the best word for it, 12 year old, he was on fire for God at 12. I mean, he's, he's, this is not a new thing. You know, he's been walking this road for a while. So I'm honored to, you know, I'm honored to be asked to come down here and, and, and get a chance to meet some of you guys and, and, and see some of you guys that I haven't seen in way too long. But uh, if you have a Bible with you, I want you to, we're going to really mainstream in two places. We're going to get to John 6. We're going to start in Genesis 1. I really want to lay a foundation for, for hearing based on the foundation of what God's Word is and what God's Word does. In Genesis 1, the very first verse, the very first chapter, it says that the earth was formless and void. You know how God changed that situation? When God wanted light in verse 3, what did he say? Anybody have verse 3? Speak up. God's, and God said. And God said. Verse 6, when he wanted a breathable atmosphere, what are your first three words in verse 6? And God said. Verse 9, God wanted dry land. How did he do it? The first three words of verse 9. Verse 11, let there be plants. But what were the first three words? The creative power of God is in his word. The power of God always follows his word. God's word always has the power to accomplish everything that is set forth to do. God's creative power is in his word. Life is in his word. Why is it so important that we hear God as believers? It's critically important because everything we need for life and godliness is in his word. It's in his word. In Genesis 1.11, God introduces the principle of the seed and he tells us how seeds work. And I really believe that God did this to lay a foundation so we'd understand how his word works. You see, in Genesis 1.11, he tells us that all seed is going to reproduce according to its own kind. If you plant corn, what's going to grow? Corn. If you plant black-eyed peas, yeah. black black -eyed eyed peas, peas. Right. Black -eyed peas are going to grow. <laughs> if you plant a watermelon seed, don't expect cucumbers to grow. Nobody does, right? We understand that seeds reproduce according to their own kind. We know that it's impossible for God to lie. We know that his word will never return void. God's mm -hmm. word works the same way. His word has the power within it to completely reproduce itself. Jesus told a parable, we call it the parable of the sower, the parable of the soils, you call it different things. But the point, really, the, a big point of that story is the farmer sows the, the seed, but that seed is the word. Jesus is trying to explain to us that God's word will always work like a seed. A seed reproduces according to its own kind. God's word reproduces according to its own kind. If we can receive God's seed, God's word, you call it hearing, you call it listening. I don't care what you call it. It's really receiving. If hearing, because to, to me, that's semantics. Because some people say, well, you're, you hear me, but you're not listening to me. Or you're listening to me, but you're not hearing me. I don't care. I don't care which one of those means what to you. What I'm talking about, it, what does it take for you to receive it? Because if, you're, if, you're, if, if words are here hitting your ears, but they're never getting to your heart, you're not doing it right. 
right? You can, you can read the words on the page all day long, but if the Holy Spirit is not communicating God's word to your heart, it's not going to change you. But I'm telling you this, child of God, if we will learn to receive his word and, and, and hold on to it, that's, that's it. That word has in and of itself the power to reproduce the life of God in us. So often we get hung up on looking at things in our lives that we don't like and we start trying to change this and we're trying to change that and we're focused on changing this behavior and changing that behavior. I'll tell you something, the more you look at that behavior, the more you're going to become like that behavior probably. God wants to change you from the inside out just by planting a word in your heart. He wants to speak to you and start birthing fruit in you in a supernatural way. In, uh, in John chapter 6, you know, I always tell people, I say, when you've got issues in your life, behaviors that don't line up with the word of God, stop trying to change your behavior and start putting effort into receiving the word. In John chapter 6, verse 28, it says, they came to Jesus and they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this. Anybody know what comes next? What is the work of God? Believe in the one he has sent. To believe in the one he has sent. Somebody comes to Jesus and they say, Jesus, I know I'm supposed to be doing something. What is it that I need to be doing? And Jesus said, you need to believe in the one who sent. Now that word believe, the, the root of that word believe is the word pistis, which you probably all know is the word that's translated faith in the New Testament. It's the Greek word that, that we take for faith. So Jesus is saying the work that God wants you to do is to have faith in the one he sent. Now let me ask you this. How does faith come? By hearing. <laughs> faith comes by hearing. So by receiving. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing is a receiving word. We receive his word and faith comes. So if that's true, then what really is our effort? If, if, because that's what the guy was asking. He's saying, where should I put my effort to make God happy? And Jesus said, put your effort into faith. We know faith comes by hearing. So the true work of God, really, if you want to, if you want to know where you want to put your effort to make a difference in your life and make a difference in the world, put your effort into hearing what God is saying. And it will change you. It'll revolutionize everything in your life. It'll change your circumstances. It will change your world. It will change your family. It will change things. Because the word of God has the power to reproduce the life and the character of God in you. If I want to walk in faith today, and faith comes by hearing, what have I got to do? I've got to hear, right? I'm sorry, Noah. What did you say? <laughs> you've got to hear. You've got to listen. Again, I, I don't care what you call it. You've got to receive, right? You've got to find how, out how to receive that word. You've got to hear it. So in verse 30, go on down in John. We're going to stick around in John 6. I, I, there's something just awesome about this chapter that God showed me a few years ago, and he just, it really resonates in my heart about really the importance of hearing what, what God has to say. Um, verse 30 says, so they ask him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Let me, let's talk about manna for a minute. How, how often did they eat the manna? Every day. They ate it every day. They, and what did it do for them? It kept them alive. That's really the best thing. It, it, they didn't thrive on manna. They were never thrilled with the manna. In fact, they grumbled frequently about the manna. But the manna allowed them to survive in a desert wasteland, right? Okay. And they ate it every day. Jesus said to them in verse 32, he said, I tell you the truth. It's not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven. It's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world, John 10, 10. Who came to give life to the world? Jesus. Jesus. So who, so the true bread of God is? Okay. Yeah, we're still tracking. Um, in Deuteronomy 8, 3, Moses is talking to the people, and you don't have to turn there. He said, 
he's explaining to them what, what happened. He says, God humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word, every word, every word mm -hmm. that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Mm -hmm. There, there, there's something going on here. There's a connection between the manna consuming it daily in the word of God. There's, there's a connection here. You see, manna really was only meant to be a physical example. It, uh, the manna was a physical manifestation of a spiritual truth that was yet to come. There was a bread from heaven that was coming that, that was going to give us more than just the ability to survive. It was going to give us the ability to overcome, the ability to thrive, the ability to really live. Life abundantly. That's what's in our bread from heaven. Well, let's keep going. Jesus, in, in verse 34, they, they ask him again. They keep asking him these questions. They said, they said, sir, from now on, give us this bread. That's pretty bold. Um, Jesus had just fed the 5,000, by the way. <laughs> They're pretty lit up on this idea of, of, of food. But they said, from now on, give us this bread. And Jesus declared, he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And let me tell you what, it's too often we think of eternal life as a sweet by and by, but eternal life is right now. Okay. Abundant life is right now. God has given us, Jesus came that we might really live right now, the fullness of life every day we walk on this earth. He is with us. He's in us. He has come that we might have life and have it abundantly. That's every day, folks. That's not thinking off into the future of, hey, I'm going to really live when I get to heaven. Well, what the heck does it matter? You're going to be walking on streets of gold. You're going to have a mansion prepared for you. We really need to learn how to live right now. And that's this concept of hearing. That's why it's so important. So the Jews began to grumble, naturally, because he said, <laughs> I am the bread from heaven. I am the bread that came down from heaven. Now, the Jews were grumbling because they held up Moses. I mean, Moses was right up there with, with God. I mean, Moses had, had given the law. He had been the administrator of the old covenant. And, you know, they held Moses in high esteem. And Jesus had just said, you know, you, you can quit thinking, Moses, I am the bread from heaven. So they're grumbling about it. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say I came down from heaven? So Jesus turned to him and he, just, he said, stop grumbling among yourselves. 45, he said, verse 45, he said, it is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. They will all be taught by God, Michael. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the father and learns from him comes to me. Everyone who listens, a kuo, a kuo is the word that means to listen. And, and here's just a side note. I don't know if you guys realize this, but. But the majority of the time when your Bible says obedience, that word is hupa kuo, which literally means to listen under, which is a receiving word, not an output word. Obedience is an output word. God's heart is not and has not ever been in your output. His heart is in you receiving him because he knows if you can receive him, it's going to change everything. It's going to draw you to his heart. You're going to understand him better and it's going to change you into his image. So it says, I am, he said, I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back up. Everyone who listens to the father and learns from him comes to me. Verse 47, I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Did I back up? He repeats himself here a little bit. I apologize in my, in my haste to get here today. I, I left my helpers for my 51 year old eyes i usually <laughs> I, I can make these words so big but um i'm used to having a little bit of help jesus went on he said in verse 51 i am the living bread that came down from heaven if anyone eats of this bread he will live forever this bread is my flesh which i give for the life of the world now jesus is about to get into really dark territory He's about to get into territory that's going to cause the majority of his disciples, not just the Jews, not just the peripheral uh, wannabes, hanger-ons. He's about to say some things that are going to cause most of his disciples to go away from him because they can't tell the difference between a physical, a physical manifestation and a spiritual truth. Okay? 
Jesus is drawing a correlation between a physical manifestation, which was the manna, and a spiritual truth, which was Jesus coming as the Word became flesh. John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. So Jesus goes on. He says, If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews begin to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I'll tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, he just keeps going. He just he steps over a line, and then he finds another one. And he's stepping over another line. He's offending everything about their religious mindset. Whoever eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. This is the bread, verse 58, that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? And down in about six verses later, it tells us that many of his disciples turned away. They couldn't, they couldn't stay. They couldn't follow. You see, we've got to be able to tell the difference between physical examples and spiritual truth. So much in the Old Covenant is about a physical example designed to lead us to a spiritual truth. And I'm going to chase a rabbit here. Marriage is a physical example designed to lead us to spiritual truth. When we talk about we are the bride of Christ, there, there are a lot of things that you see in the world that, that the enemy is really trying to degrade the definition of what things are. It's critical that the church protect the definition that is in this word because it's important to God. There are physical examples that are designed to lead people to understand how to relate to God. And Oh, I want to go there, but I'm not going to. We're talking about hearing God, but I just want you to think about that. Look, when you're reading the word, understand it's on, there's two levels here. There are physical examples and there are spiritual truths. And the Jews got hung up on the physical example. They never could get to the spiritual truth. So aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to him, does this offend you? Well, sure. yeah. Uh, the, he said, this, listen, Jesus is going to explain to, to us what he's talking about. He said, the spirit gives life. Flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. What Jesus is saying is that if we want to walk in life, we need to learn to receive from the spirit. We have got to learn how to hear the spirit because the spirit gives life. The spirit is the equivalent of the manna in the desert. Do you see this? They had to eat the manna. You know, I, I cringe when people tell me that they go to church to get fed. My goodness, you starving people. If you just eat once a week, you're going to get awful hungry. You can, I eat more than that. You can tell. You know, God designed us to feed on his word daily. The manna was a daily thing. And, and here's a cool thing about the manna. They had to go out and have a, it was, it was quite an effort. They had to go out and gather the manna. And, and it was quite a, a work because the manna was just really fine and small. And so to feed a family, you're going to have to gather quite a bit of manna. They're out there working every day. And the only day they didn't have to gather manna was the Sabbath day. Let me tell you something. Jesus is our Sabbath. He lives in us. You don't have to walk outside your door. You don't have to get out of your bed to receive your bread from heaven. Do you know that? All you've got to do is say, Father, speak to me. Lord, speak to me today. I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm listening to you. Speak to me. I love, I love to start my day in the word, and I encourage everybody to do it. But I'll tell you this. If you're deserted on an island somewhere without a Bible in sight, you can still hear God's voice. Right. Hearing God's voice is the critical element. It contains everything everything from the parent plant are you hearing me god's word is his seed and if we will learn to receive it and it's not as much learning as much as just determining in our hearts that we're not going to settle for less god i got to hear you today i'm feeling i'm getting really hungry in the spirit I, I just need a word from you just speak to me prayer is more than god here's a list of my wants and my needs and my desires prayer cannot be a one-way street we have got to learn how to hear how to listen to what God is saying. Because I'm telling you what, guys, 
God will listen patiently to every desire of your heart because he loves you with an unfathomable love. I mean, it's, it's incomprehensible to me how much God loves us. I, I know a lot of us. It's, it's, it's beyond my imagination, that kind of love. But that's the kind of love God has for us. He will sit there and he will listen patiently to everything you have to say and love every second of it. But he desperately wants in this relationship for you to learn how to just turn your ear to him and say, okay, God, that's, I've, I've unloaded. Now, talk to me. Talk to me. I, I, I love to start every, every day in the word. I love that. But let me tell you, the word to me, if the word is about rules and regulations, it's not going to do much for you because the Bible doesn't say that reading the word produces faith. It's not, it's not reading, it's hearing Faith comes by hearing, not by reading. Are you with me? So when you're reading the word, you've got to engage the spirit. My goodness, have a conversation with God. Start to think about the word of God as a platform for discussion. Think about that. You have a chance to read the word and have a discussion with the one who was there on the front row at the core of what was going on. Some of the most awesome revelations I've had were conversations with God, why is Paul doing this? And, and just letting God speak to me about that. God, why is Solomon starting so strong and ending so poorly? What's going on here? And, and just allowing the Spirit of God to, to speak to me about it. God wants that. You can't imagine how desperately God wants to have a relationship with you. And a relationship involves communication. Two ways. Two ways, Noah. He wants to hear what you've got to say, but he wants you to hear him. Or listen, or whichever word you prefer. He wants you to receive his word. The spirit speaks to us the very words of God. The spirit speaks the word. And I'm telling you, friends, if, if we will really learn how to receive, if we will learn how to hear, it's going to change us. And fruit comes from the seed of God. His word will not return void. It will produce fruit in us if we will receive it. Now, here's the problem. The Bible says that they will know you by your fruit. And the world is full and the church is full of fruit inspectors. But because other people are going to judge us by our fruit, the tendency is when we see behaviors and actions or, or lack of fruit, the tendency is to, to go cut out pictures in the magazine and tape them to our tree or go down to the dollar store and get some wax fruit and hang them up with little Christmas tree hangers. That's the tendency because we don't want people to judge us poorly. But I want, to, I want you to know something. Real fruit takes time. Real fruit, it, there's an element of faith. And anytime you talk about, you can't talk about faith without an element of time. Because if there's no element of time, there's no faith. There's just, hey, it exists. Great. You don't have to believe for something you have. Faith involves an element of time. And that seed, nobody plants a peach seed in the backyard and goes out the next day and throws a fit because they don't have peaches. We get that, right? We get that. Nobody goes out in the spring and sees just a little, a little willowy stem stepping, standing up out of the ground. You don't go out and cut it off because it doesn't have peaches. Give yourself a break if you will focus on receiving the word and quit fretting so much about behaviors and actions that you would prefer not be in your life. Do two things for me. Number one, receive the word. Number two, listen, if you're living like the world, stop receiving the world's seed. Okay? Because your heart will grow if I'm getting loud on you just because I'm getting excited. <laughs> if, Bring it. if you receive the world's seed, your heart will produce the world's fruit. Okay? Your heart is designed to, to produce the, the, to grow the seed that you plant in it. So think about that. Think about what you're receiving. I'm telling you this right now. Start with receiving the word because there's no more powerful seed than the word. Start there. And then as God starts to speak to you and he starts to point out some other seed that maybe you're receiving. He's not saying, I want you to go and I want you to go change your behavior. He's saying, I want you to receive this and hold on to it and say, God, you spoke this to me. I know you're going to give me that. I know that you have given me the power to overcome it. I know what you have is better than what the world has. I will believe what you say. I had a lady come to me after I preached last Sunday, and she one of the most awesome questions I've ever had. She said, what do you mean by standing on the word? 
Uh, you know, we use church words so often, and, and we don't think about people that haven't, been, haven't grown up in church really knowing what, th- what things mean. And, and it just blessed me because I, I got to step back and say, here's what I mean. What I mean is, if God says something, that's, what we, that's where we stake our life. That's where we live. If we feel sick, but God says that we are healed, Isaiah 53, thank you very much. I am healed by the wounds of Jesus. I will stand on that truth, even if I'm coughing and spitting up, whatever. It's bigger than what I feel. No matter what I feel, I'm going to stand on the word. If I am standing on the word, that means my behavior may not have come back in line. I don't know if you ever read the story of Abraham. Abraham was the father of the faith. Abraham was going through these kingdoms and farming out his wife because he was afraid that they were going to take him, take her by force. This was the woman who the promise was to come through that he was going to be the father of many nations. He, he twice. He gave his wife to rulers while he was going through their nations because they looked out and they go, man, that's one good looking woman. And I'm telling you, she must have been a looker because she was not a young thing. (laughs) But they would look at her and he would go, oh, she's my sister. You take her. I'm saying Abraham, the father of the faith, doesn't look like faith. So cut yourself a break. If things in your life don't look like faith, if you will focus, I promise you this, children of God, sons and daughters of the king, I've been walking this road for 45 some years or so. If you will just receive his seed and give it time to grow, it will reproduce God in you. It'll change everything. Here. Here. Amen. Anybody have any comments? Good service. Thank you. Well, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for bringing us together today. We're so grateful to be here. Yes. I ask you to speak to us, Lord. Thank you for speaking to us. Yes. Helping us tune in to your word, Lord, to understand that hearing, receiving yes. is the key, Lord. Yes. Thank you for helping us to receive Uh, your word lord the seed of your word and allowing it to grow in our lives in jesus name amen let's bust up into some small groups pray before we dismiss when you're done charlotte what are we doing after this and where is s'mores so when you're finished please be mindful of the fact that other people might be praying take your stuff with you to small group prayer and when you're done just exit the chapel or go put you can put your bible and stuff back in your room and then we'll be out here for s'mores directly after so for small group um man i got i got we got some great people here let's do uh um uh charlotte will you lead one and if you'll take them into you know one of these back cubbies or something uh and let's do you mean just pick people uh girls okay daria if you'll take the remaining girls and go into another one uh, with my wife if you'll take the remaining girls with daria okay. so they yeah whoever charles you know okay. picking so pick three with charla all right, the rest of the girls go with uh, those two. Uh, boys, uh, Explosive yeah. Joseph, if you'll take a group <laughs> of gentlemen into one of these side cubbies. You know what? Take everybody's not leaving. Oh, Kindle, yeah, Kindle.